Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I apologise for not being as flamboyant and as garishly dressed as my predecessor, Michael Portillo. Um, <laughs> but I've, I've given into it. I've worn green trousers, so that's as much as you're getting out of me, OK? Uh, there's a reason why I'm involved with EB and why I felt so privileged and honoured to be nominated and asked. Um, it's because I'm relevant. I feel relevant. Although I've never had EB, nobody in my family's ever had EB. Um, we've been very fortunate in that regard. But I have spent quite a large part of my life without skin on my body. I lay in hospital from a 20-year-old, almost 21-year-old guardsman who was a rugby player, who was a very physical character, to all of a sudden being so reliant on others um, because of the lack of skin. And that then made me decide, it helped me make that conscious decision as to would I, would I accept the, uh, the op offer of, of being president. And I was so very, very privileged when I, I realised just how much resonance it had in my life. And I was listening to Jim speak there and he mentioned wound healing. Well, I've been involved with uh, wound healing for an awful long time. Um, it started life as the Phoenix Appeal then went on to something else, and now it's called the Scar Free Foundation. And I've been involved in that, and I'm the lead ambassador for that, which I've done for the best part of 30 years. Um, and it, it's so relevant. And I remember opening the centre in, in Manchester, and please don't take offence if you're that way in kind as to how they do their research using salamanders and newts, but they do grow their legs and their tails back. Um, you know, it's true. Um, but it's all about finding out how that works, finding out is there any way, and eventually at some point I'm fairly certain they'll, they'll discover it, how long it'll take, Lord only knows. But it is all about how, finding out how Mother Nature actually can regenerate itself. So I have been involved in a different capacity, but in a similar capacity as well, because the role that I have, unlike all the trustees and all the other people who have official roles and titles, um, in the sense of they have obligations and legal obligations. Mine is just a moral one. And it's the nicest one to have. It's, the, it's in my way, it's the most comfortable one. Because all I have to do is support and try my very best to help promote and make the greater world aware, certainly in Great Britain, of the struggle and the need for support for EB and the research and for all the development of all the different projects that you have going to help support the nurses, to help support all the funding towards nurses. That's the role that I have. And I'm so privileged to take that on. And I'm so happy, and it's also, you mean, I might as well tell you, I've given up doing all my military work. And the reason I've given that up is not because I don't like doing it and I haven't enjoyed it, but I didn't see that I fit in there. I didn't feel as relevant as I do to, to Deborah. And that's why I've become involved in it. So that's why you've got me for as long as you've got me and you've got me for as long as you want me. Um, and that might be very, very short after this short speech. <laughs> but for the moment, I'll, 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 I'll bask in the glory of that one. Um, you know, it, it's odd. It's odd, you know. For me, when I was in hospital, I had no idea of, of what was actually going on in many ways because the loss of skin, the trans transfer of skin from one part of the body to the other, and I'm thinking, hang on, you've covered one part of my body with skin, but the part you took the skin from is actually hurting like hell. And then all of a sudden you get that itch. And, um, and I don't want to dwell on the itch because it, it's, it's something that you're all fully aware of. Um, but for us in hospital, it was something very, very unusual. Even though I'd been a rugby player and, uh, and I'd got grass burns, but don't worry, I'm not going to dwell on rugby primarily because most of you are English and what the hell do you know about the game? <laughs> yeah, with a South African who had to come on in the, so you could defeat Wales, but we won't go into the finer points of that one. <laughs> Trust me, you can heckle as much as you want. I got a microphone, okay? <laughs> and it's not my, hey, this is not my first rodeo. <laughs> but yeah, so, um, and having been in that situation, I had no idea. And the longest operation I had whilst I was in hospital, um, and they, they decided, because I had 
they were able to deal with the infections they had inside, but they couldn't deal with the ones that were on the outside. Um, and they did two things that one is very normal um, for, for plastic surgery, but the other one is, was very abnormal and they didn't follow nice guidelines because fortunately for the military, in times of war and situations like that, they can cut corners, obviously in the benefit of the patient, but they do and they take chances. Uh, but for me, they, they did something, they, they had all these bugs and um, at one point they were barrier nursing me and they then decided they'd bath me in this pink stuff. Um, it was called hydrochloros, which is basically industrial bleach disinfectant. They bathed me in it. The first time I slid into the bath, was wonderful. This beautiful old sort of cast iron bath with the legs of oh, beautiful. Slid in, oh wow, fantastic. The second time I went to slide in it, the hydrochloros had taken all that lovely shiny white enamel off. You could have struck matches underwater. So I thought I was gonna to have to have skin grafts on my bum after that. Um, but then they, they, they gave me the longest operation I'll ever have because they wanted to cover the whole of the, the open areas. Um, and that went in for the double figures of hours, well over 10 hours of surgery. And I remember waking up from that feeling awful. And normally, it, my, my wife is here, she'll tell you, I can have four or five hours of surgery, wake up and eat a four course meal. Right, I don't have that problem with the gas in the stomach and all the rest of it. I probably talk in my sleep so I get it out, don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> That's probably true, don't worry. Anyway, so I remember lying there and I'd had this really long surgery and I had the drips in the tops of my feet because they couldn't use my hands. They couldn't use my arms because the veins were too deep. And I'm lying there, I've, 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 got, a, I've got bandages on my head, tail down the back, like a big kepi, like a foreign legion kepi. And uh, I've got big orange eye pads where they've given me new eyelids. And I've got um, all these bandages. And the bandages are held on with a, a body stocking, not the sort of body stocking that Jim likes to wear on the weekend, but <laughs> this was a, a surgical body stocking and it was keeping all the dressings on to keep me cool. And, um, and I, I'm lying there, I've got my arms up in the air, I've got things called K-wires in my fingers to keep my fingers stiff, stop my hands clawing up, which you're all too, uh, too well aware of that, that, the way that that happens. Um, and I'm lying there and I'm feeling absolutely dreadful. And I'm lying and I'm just coming around and I'll describe the bay that I'm in, because it's a four man bay. It was originally designed as a maternity ward, but then it became the Burns and Plastics ward. And it had a wall that came in, which was actually the loo, but you had to go out through the double doors and use it outside. Um, so they had the double doors there and then they had a small wall and this huge big pane of glass. That was the window. And I'm lying in this bed with my legs slightly elevated, my arms in slings, and I've got this head and the eye patches and eyes like two stab marks in a pig's bottom. And I'm looking out like this. And I'm lying there feeling absolutely dreadful. And all I can hear is bumpity bump, 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 bumpity bump, bumpity bump. And I looked out like that and I'm thinking, that's driving me insane. And it's amazing if you've ever had any surgery and you've been under the anaesthetic for a while, when you wake up, sounds are amplified. They're amplified. And I'm, oh, she's driving me insane. So I look out and I can see these two lads kicking a football in the corridor. One is a guy called Mark Pemberton, who was my corporal. Um, and, you know, tragically for us, there was only three of us out of 15 survived. And there was another guy called uh, Brummy Richards, Mark Richards from, from, obviously from Birmingham, from Solihull. And um, they were kicking a football. I don't know which one of it was. He, he lashed the football. It hit this big window and it was like a bomb went off. And one of them ran in, grabbed the ball, and put the ball under my bed. <laughs> and these two fellas scarpered. <laughs> and I'm lying there going, what's going on? And I'm coming around from anesthetic, I go, what the hell is happening? And all of a sudden, this young nurse ran into the room. Now, just to assure you, right, I'm very supportive of the nurses and the medical profession, and some of them are very bright. But she wasn't. <laughs> and she ran in. And she burst through the doors. Why she bothered, I don't know. There was no window left. <laughs> she ran in and she looked at the ball under the bed. She looked at the pile of crystals that was sitting on the floor, looked at the void that used to be the window, looked at me lying in bed with drips and arms in the air and bandages and everything else. And she kept doing this sort of quadruple take. And she went, tell me, did you do this? 
<laughs> not the brightest bulb on a Christmas tree, right? The silly mare. But anyway, that's another story. But anyway, um, th those are some of my experiences in hospital, and I'm, I'm not going into all of them because there are some very young, younger members in the audience, and um, maybe it's a bit too adult, some of the stories. But it was a very funny place. It was a very funny place. And the stoicism and the support that we had from people and the stoicism from the other patients and people who had been patients, who had been there and done it all before us because we weren't the first guys and we weren't going to be the last. But we had all that support. And when I look at Deborah and I look at all of the community and all the people that I've been fortunate to meet so far and I see people that I haven't met yet and I know I will if I don't meet you today, I will meet you over the future and for the, for the length of the time that I'm involved. But what I do know is that nobody does it on their own. Nobody gets it on their own. We all enjoy the company and the strength that other people give us. And together, we can achieve so much. Apart, we struggle. But together, we can also support each other and we can help to bring a certain amount of happiness to each other. And ultimately, a lot of it is a state of mind a state of mind that we can all see something happen in the future, can be bright, how far down the line that is. We know things are changing, we know things are happening. We know these great scientists and medical people are making a difference and the pharmaceutical companies now that they're starting to think about it and get on board. Things will change, things will change. And for somebody to benefit tomorrow, somebody suffered today. And that's the way I've always looked about us that got burnt. You know, the First World War, all of those people, McIndoe and Gillies, McIndoe in the Second World War, Gillies, Harold Gillies in the First, they made a difference. They made a difference. And ultimately, that's really all Deborah is trying to do. That's all you lot are trying to do, make a difference. And there's been the long last question forever, for time immemorial, why are we on this planet? Why are we here? Well, it's very straightforward. We're here to make a difference what our Lord and Master's got in mind for us, we will find out when we get there. But until we get there, whilst we're here, it's just to make a difference. That's all it's about. And as long as that difference is a positive contribution to somebody else's life, we make a positive contribution to our own. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, I'm so very pleased and proud and privileged to have the role of president. Sadly, it doesn't give me any great power, because... <laughs> I've got a crazy, mad, bad hairdo, so I do take on a semblance of the sad, mad, bad and crazy bloke in America. But, you know, <laughs> you'll just have to do with the fact that I'm in that honorary titled role. But it is a privilege to be here with you. I'm so glad and I'm so glad to have met the people I've met. And, um, yeah, enjoy the rest of your weekend. I hope you enjoy my tenure. Have a great, great weekend. You know, but I do question the weekend you chose. I do question that because my beloved Scarlets are playing the Ospreys today to see whether they get to the final, right? I know Jim is upset because St Mirren are playing today and they may get relegated. Seriously, there is so much rugby going on today. Who chose this weekend? But look, it is what it is. Um, but hopefully the outcome for everybody at the end of it will be the same as it will be when the Scarlets win. Enjoy the rest of it and thank you very much for having me. Thank you.